hello and good morning, Flynn First. Thank you guys all so much for being here. It's a beautiful day out. If you guys would like to stand up, we are going to worship our Lord this morning. You call me out upon the waters in the great unknown where theme they fail and there I find you in the mystery in oceans deep my faith will My soul will rest in your embrace, for I am yours, and you are mine. Your grace and bound in deepest water. Sovereign hand will be my guide. Where feet may fail and fear surrounds me, you've never failed, then you won't start now. And I will call.
Sings my soul, my Savior, God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior, God, to Thee. How great Thou art. shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home what joy shall fill my heart then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim And sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art.
take this minute. We're going to open up our altars this morning. And maybe there's something that uh, that's on your heart today that you just want to come and you want to give it to God this morning. We'd invite you to come and, and either kneel at the altars or maybe just sit on the front pew and just give your petitions and your burdens to God if he's leading you at this time. Please come forward. this out. 
Shall we pray? Father, we love you this morning. In that song, Lord, of how great thou art. You are above, you are beyond. All that we could think or ask for. Father, we're so thankful that you sent your son, Jesus, to walk this earth. But not just to this walk this earth, but to go to the cross for our sins. And then when he went to heaven, Lord, you sent your Holy Spirit, who is here right now in this sanctuary. And I pray, Lord, for those that may be watching online, that they will also feel God's presence in that room where they are right now. So, Father God, I pray that you will rain down upon us, Lord, and the Holy Spirit will just have his way this morning. Father, David in Psalms 91 cried out to you. He said to God, he is my refuge. He is my fortress. He is my God who I trust. We're trusting in you this morning. Father, there are so many that are hurting this morning and so many trust struggles, but we know we have a God that knows everything about it and everything about each one of us. Lord, I don't know, Mary Alice, if you're watching us online, we pray, Lord, that you will continue to heal that that pacemaker will make you stronger and God will make you stronger. Glenda, if you're watching us from your chair, we miss you and we ask that God will put a healing touch. Make your heart stronger, make your eyes see better. Miss Paula, if you're watching, Lord, we're praying for you and your dad and for this transition. I pray for peace, Lord, for your dad. And I pray for the time together you have with him. And whatever else that may be going on, Lord, this morning, those that are hurting. It could be marriages, addictions. It could be so many things. But we have a God that in spite of all this that we can trust. We love you this morning. 
We thank you, Lord, for your presence here this morning. Anoint Pastor Chad as he speaks, Lord, and that we will listen with our hearts and that we will go out of this service this morning a different person. So, Lord, continue to rain down upon us. We love you. We thank you. In the name of Jesus, amen. Good morning, Flint First. We are so glad that you are here worshiping with us, either in person or online. Um, we just want to continue to connect with you and offer what we can to you in your faith journey. So go ahead and scan that QR code, stop by the welcome desk, or use um, the link that is posted in the Facebook comments so we can go ahead and connect with you. Also, those are the same ways that you can give your tithes and offerings to Flint First so we can t continue to do our ministries here. If you have any questions, just let any of our leadership know. Um, the trustees are asking you to come out on Saturday, October 7th from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. for our church work day. This is an opportunity for you to come out and serve on the church grounds to get it ready for winter. So if you are able to come, that would be great because the more people here, the more work that we can get done. Following service today, we will be taking some leadership pictures in preparation for our 100th and 10th anniversary and just to update some of our records. So if you are a part of leadership or on any kind of team here, whether it be missions, children's, worship team, whatever it may be, we are asking you to stick after service so we can get these pictures done and get them updated so we can continue planning for our anniversary celebration. And then starting on October 2nd, at midnight, we will be doing our second prayer train, our 24 hours prayer train. So it starts at midnight on October 2nd and goes all throughout the day. So there's a sign-up sheet at the welcome desk, or you can, again, use that QR code or link, and there is a link in that um, to sign up for your slot. So these are 30-minute slots that we're just asking you to be intentional for towards prayer for Flint First, for its leadership, for its future, um, whatever is laid on your heart. So if you are willing to claim a 30-minute slot, um, make sure that you sign up at the welcome desk or using that link. Also, in um, something that changed from the last time to this time, we are hoping to do this monthly. So there's an extra column that we're asking you if you want to keep that same time slot for the next time around to make a mark in that column so that you can claim that spot for the next time as well. So if you have any questions, go, go ahead and see myself or Miss Ida May as our prayer director. And at this time, our kids are dismissed, but we want to let you know 
that next Sunday there will be no children's ministry. So all our kids will be staying upstairs during Pastor Amy's sermon, just so you parents have a heads up of what is going on. So kids, you are dismissed to go downstairs with Miss Heather. Well, good morning. Uh, again, welcome to Flint First. I really am excited about this 24-hour prayer chain. I think it's a great opportunity for us to be intentional, to be in prayer about the future of the church and where God would have us to go. But it also gives us the opportunity, you know, again, as Ida prayed beautifully this morning, there's a lot of burdens, there's a lot of need, there's a lot of pain and hurt in our world today, but it also gives us an opportunity to be intentional for lifting up members of this church or family members uh, for things that are going on in their life, to come alongside them in prayer, to intercede with them. And that just is a fancy word that says to come alongside, to be with them. As they are praying, you can pray with them for the same need so that God says where two or more are gathered, he is there. And this is an opportunity for us to, to do that together as a team. Again, if you don't know me, my name is Chad. I'm the co-lead pastor with my wife, Amy. And it's, again, our privilege to be able to, uh, to come and to serve alongside you guys as we do our ministries here in Flint. We are in the middle of our series. This is the fourth week of the series called The Bible Doesn't Say That. Uh, and over the various weeks, we've been working on clearing up some misunderstandings and some phrases that we hear in our culture all the time. You know, that, that people just tend to say, but in reality, if you look in Scripture... The Bible doesn't actually say that. In the last few weeks, we've, we've covered some different topics, like God won't give you more than you can handle. God hates sinners. God helps those who help themselves. We learned how the Bible does not say that. Those are not true. Today, today's verse is, is very similar. It, it may actually be considered the most famous one, or, or perhaps it's the most abused one, quite possibly the most dangerous one. Today, we're talking about how the Bible doesn't say that everything happens for a reason. It does not say that God causes everything to happen. Now, in reality, society is split on this one. You'll find arguments on both sides of the issue. You'll find those that believe this is indeed true and those who adamantly claim that it's false. So let's start with a few examples of each. The first one comes from a blog site called Got Questions. So let's look at this together. So it says, there are several known factors that help us answer this question. The law of cause and effect. The law of grace. The doctrine of the providence of God. These factors demonstrate that everything does happen for a reason, not just by happenstance or random chance. Let's look at another one. Eventually, all things fall into place. Until then, laugh at the confusion, live for the moment, and know everything happens for a reason. Let's go to the next one. We have a few of them here. This is from the American theologian Marilyn Monroe. All right. <laughs> I, I believe that everything happens for a reason. People change so that you can learn to let go. Things go wrong so that you can appreciate them when they're right. You believe lies so that eventually you learn to trust no one but yourself. And sometimes good things fall apart so better things can fall together. And the last one, I trust that everything happens for a reason, even if we're not wise enough to see it. Today, we have a, a scripture from the Old Testament, and we have a scripture from the New Testament. Now, these scriptures are sometimes used by these people to defend that God has everything planned out. We're all just players in his great drama. Many who say yes look to these verses, and even stories like Joseph in Genesis chapter 50. Genesis chapter 50, verse 20 says, You intended harm, to harm me, excuse me, but God intended it for good. He brought me to this position so that I could save the lives of many people. Now, if we continue reading out the rest of Genesis, we'll, we'll, we'll understand that the end of, it shares the end of the story of Joseph's life. And, and maybe you don't know the story of Joseph. Joseph 
was the father, or oh, excuse me, was the son of uh, Jacob, and Jacob loved him very much, and his brothers were very jealous. And so the brothers eventually took him and sold him into slavery. They, first of all, they put him in a pit to store him away until some buyer came along, and then they sold him into slavery. Ultimately, though, he went to slavery. He ended up going to jail because of a, a series of events and ended up giving uh, the ability to answer a dream for, for Pharaoh. He was able to, to share and interpret a dream because God gave him the gift and the ability to interpret the dream. Pharaoh was so impressed by this that he ultimately became second in command for all of Egypt, second only to the Pharaoh. And just to be a uh, spoil breaker, so you, you know, please go ahead and read Genesis, but the spoil breaker is that Joseph actually saved Egypt from a famine that was a seven-year-long famine. And because of his interpretation of the dream, they were able to prepare. And he not only saved Egypt, but he was able to save his brothers, the same brothers that sold them into slavery, and their neighbors. Now, when you read all this, you can see where it'd be easy to conclude that Joseph was indeed trapped in that hole and sold to the Egyptians so that he could prevent them and their neighbors from going hungry. You could see that. There's a strong case to be made that this innocent man was being sold into slavery was all a part of God's plan. But I don't think it was. But we'll, we'll get into that. So now let's look at the New Testament reading. Turn with me to Romans chapter 8, verse 28. We know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to their purpose for it them, to his purpose for them. So again, this kind of sounds like that saying, everything happens for a reason. So we can totally see where this confusion comes from. But the truth is, this version, this translation, falls short of the Greek. But we'll get to that in a second. So again, this sounds like our verse today, and so many well-meaning people have literally hurt other people. They've devastated other people by using this phrase, everything happens for a reason, when they really meant to help them. So let's look at those who say that's not what this means. Everything does not happen for a reason. It's not caused by God. Freelance writer Nicholas Clermont wrote in another blog post this statement. Everything happens for a reason is my very least thing for someone to say. It's a bad philosophy, it's bad theology, it's bad thinking, and it's bad advice. It manages to combine the maximum of ignorance with the maximum of arrogance. Ouch. Let's go to the next one. While God certainly gives our lives meaning, the idea that everything we suffer all the horrible experiences we've ever endured have a purpose and a meaning is actual harmful to our Christian walk. So which group is right? They both sound very passionate, don't they? They seem like they both could be true. Which one is right? All right, let's take a vote. If you believe it's right, let's... No, I'm just kidding. All right, we're not going to do it. All right. Uh, so the reality is that the big C, the global church... They don't agree with this issue either. There are certain camps that have thought that say the church, they say that everything is called theological determinism. That's a very fancy way of saying, yes, God is completely sovereign, but there is no free will. Everything happens for a reason, and God's that reason. This means that we can attribute the most recent hurricane that we saw down in the south or the earthquake that we saw in Morocco as an act of God, or worse yet, the judgment of God on the people or the group of mankind in general. Now, as well-meaning people, I think we can see the danger in this thinking. And then there's our line of thinking, our branch of the theological tree, if you will. As Arminians, our understanding that God is indeed sovereign. But we balance that with the free will and the choice that he has given each of us. We believe that God knows everything that will happen, but that knowledge does not mean that God caused it to happen. He simply operates based on his knowledge, but mankind is still given the ability to choose their choices. So this means, no, God is not the cause behind everything. Even though God still knows what's going to happen, he didn't cause it to happen. 
So again, if we argue who's right on this one, you could almost say literally both are right. A little bit. Because from a literal standpoint, again, just look at a literal standpoint, everything does happen for a reason. In other words, everything is caused by something. Sometimes the reason is simply cause and effect. The tornado blew the roof off, so we had to go find another place to stay. It snowed all night long, so the streets were slippery in the morning. Do you see how because of something, there's an effect? Sometimes the reason is simply the choices we make. Again, our free will to choose. Things that we choose to do or not to do can lead to intended or even unintended consequences. But the reason behind them was a choice that we made. I saw this saying on a meme, and I had to share it because I think it fits this category very well. Everything happens for a reason, but sometimes the reason is that you're stupid and you made a bad decision. Now, I know, I know, that's a little harsh, but it's true, right? We've all made some dumb decisions in our life, have we not? Is it God's fault we made those dumb decisions? Is he to blame? No. The next one, sometimes the reason is simply because of accidents. Accidents do happen, and they fit under cause and effect. But the effect of whatever caused it was indeed an accident. There are tragedies that happen by accident. For example, a bus driver who lost control because there was ice on the road and crashed. It wasn't intentional. It was an accident. And then sometimes there is divine interaction. There is sometimes divine intervention. Obviously, there's times where God intervenes and God gets involved and God brings about certain results. That's undeniable. There are times that he is the reason things happen. But the point is, although everything happens for a reason, God is not always the reason everything happens. Do you understand? There's cause and effects happening all around us. The reason behind things may be a natural consequence to willful decisions. The reason may be accidental, providential, or even a combination of both. We have to be careful not to attribute every bad thing that ever happened to God. There's a very short gap between the idea that God is the reason behind everything and God is to blame for everything. So where did this idea come from? We're going to look to Scripture here in a moment, but we have to understand that fundamentally there are two things that humans don't like. There's mystery and science, or silence. Excuse me. So let me prove it to you. I'm going to tell you a secret. Okay, everybody ready? You listening? See, we hate the silence, don't we? Are you annoyed yet? The silence bugs us. We have to fill in the gap of that silence. We really don't like silence. To us, it's awkward. It's uncomfortable. When we're faced with a situation where there's no logical explanation, it's human nature to try to solve the mystery, to shatter the silence by saying something, anything, we can't handle the mystery of not knowing why something happened. We also can't handle the silence of not knowing what to say. So when we run into a mystery in life, a tragedy that we can't explain, we struggle in the silence, in the waiting. We resort to Christian platitudes like this one. Everything happens for a reason. The problem is it's not totally in Scripture. So again, why do people think it's in Scripture? As we said, with all of these, it's close to Scripture, but not quite there. And I think this has led to the confusion. It's a misinterpretation or a filling in the gaps. Let's go back to this culprit verse, Romans chapter 8. And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to their purpose for them. 
By the way, please don't ever tell anybody everything happens for a reason after a tragedy. I know you mean well and you're trying to, to say a kind thing, but we want to remind them that God is always present. But the problem is by saying this, again, it's not totally biblical, but it also leads to a misunderstanding of who God is. By saying this, we're implying that God causes these bad things to happen in our lives. When we use the logic that God orchestrated it all, one can make the, God, the argument that everything is God's will, and therefore everything is God's fault. And to be honest, some theologians actually do believe this, but let's take it to its logical conclusion. If you follow that line of thinking, God causes typhoons, earthquakes, hurricanes. God causes every job loss, every sickness, every disease. If a marriage ends in divorce because of adultery, it was because God intended it, not because a spouse made a poor decision and strayed. When parents have lost a child and are looking for an, un, an explanation for this unthinkable loss, it was all part of God's bigger plan. At best, this makes God the author of suffering and evil. At worst, it makes God a sadist who enjoys seeing us in pain. Ladies and gentlemen, this is not the God we serve. This is not what Scripture tells us at all. From the beginning of Scripture in Genesis, we read that God made the universe and everything in it. And he placed Adam and Eve in the garden and he gave them dominion over it. Gave them dominion over it. Now to me, that doesn't sound like a micromanaging puppet master. It sounds like he gave them the choice. His intention was to be present with them, but to leave room for mankind to have the choice. It was never God's intention for Adam and Eve to disobey. They were not specifically created to sin. They were not created to turn their backs on God and eat of the fruit on purpose. They were created with the ability to choose right from wrong with free will. They had the ability to obey and to disobey. And because of their choice, now we have sin in the world. But God is not to blame. Let's jump into the rest of our passage here and back up to Romans 20, chapter 8, verses 22. And I think the scripture is pretty clear that bad things in life will happen, not because God is orchestrating them, but because this world and its people are marred by sin. When Adam and Eve chose to follow their own way and not God's way, it led to consequences for humanity and for creation. We're living under the weight of the curse of that sin. And the very planet we live on is under the weight of the sin as well. So let's read in Romans. For we know that all creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. And we believers also groan, even though we have the Holy Spirit within us as a foretaste of future glory, for we long for our bodies to be released from sin and suffering. If we go to the next slide. We, too, wait with eager hope for the day when God will give us our full rights as his adopted children, including the new bodies he has promised us. We were given this hope when we were saved. Did you catch that? Paul says that creation has been groaning. Now, creation here is personified as a woman in labor waiting on the birth of her child. Just as humanity falls short of the glory of God, so creation as a whole needs to be redeemed. All the way back from Genesis 3, when the ground was cursed for man's sake, to Revelation 22, when the curse is removed by Christ, we read of a word, world infected and imprinted by sin. Not only that, but Paul says that mankind is groaning as well. Those of us who have been saved by Christ know that even though we're saved, everything was not immediately made whole. Sin is still at work in this world. We know that we are adopted children of God, and we also understand that we haven't fully realized what that means to be a child of God. There are so many things we don't understand, but we know that we have not claimed our full rights as his kids. We know that one day God is going to give us new bodies. We know that God is going to make things right. He's going to make things whole. We also know that things 
are not right yet. But this is where our hope comes from. Let's continue reading in Romans chapter 8. And the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. For example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for, but the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. And the Father who knows our hearts knows what the Spirit is saying, for the Spirit pleads for us believers in harmony with God's will. Do you get that? The Holy Spirit is interceding for us. Remember what I said at the beginning of the message? The interceding is coming alongside us and praying with us. He's our advocate. He's our counselor. He intercedes for us to God when we pray. He hears the greatest hurts of our hearts, and he brings them before God on our behalf. Think about this. If God is causing everything to happen, why would God's Holy Spirit be interceding for us for things that God wants to actually happen? Why would the Holy Spirit need to pray for us when the things that are happening are what God wants to happen? If that was God's intention. That would mean that God was sending the Holy Spirit to save us from him. Right? Clearly, that's not what he's saying. What he is saying is that God is fighting for us. That's the context of this verse. Let's continue reading again our, our culprit verse today. We know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. Now, I mentioned earlier that this falls short of the Greek, and let me show you the same verse in the NIV translation. It says, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him and have been called according to his purpose. The difference is in those tiny two little letters. But it's a Grand Canyon worth of a difference. We know that in all things. If you study Bible translations, you'll know that the NIV is a little bit more accurate translation in the original Greek than the NLT. And this verse shows us that no matter what happens, good or bad, explainable or unexplainable, God is at work. He's working in the lives of those who believe those who love him. God doesn't cause everything to happen, but no matter what happens, God is at work. He's shaping the most tragic situations for God in the lives of the believers who love him, who have put their faith in him to guide their lives. Now, let me give you a real-life example, and I did ask for permission to share this from the family, but Deanna Clan, she passed away a little over a year ago, at the age of 39, from cancer. She left behind a husband, three little girls. Now, did God cause Deanna to die of cancer and rob these girls of precious years with their mother? Do you hear how ridiculous that sounds? Or did God work through the tragedy of Deanna's death to help her husband to raise these girls? Do you hear the difference? It's profound. The wrong translation says God did this to you, but the right translation is that no matter what, God is with you. Now, Paul, the author of this, this chapter or this book, uh, was no stranger to conflict. In fact, he wrote this letter to the, to the Romans while he was waiting for a trial in front of the emperor. In these circumstances that Paul it was in these circumstances that Paul penned this verse. He's saying that regardless of my circumstances even, you know, he in himself is in this situation. And even regardless of that, God is at work to bring about his perfect will in the end. I think the misconception of this verse leads to two issues. The first one is fatalism. If God causes everything to happen, then what's the use of even trying in life? Why should I pray for guidance? If everything happens was meant to happen, then what point is there to keep living and growing and learning? Let's just let life play out. It's not up to me anyway. 
this can only lead to apathy or lack of caring. The second issue is this leads to excuse. If God, causes every, or if God is the cause behind everything, then we can revo- avoid the responsibility for our bad decisions. There are decisions that we make every day, and every one of them comes with consequences. Every time we climb into a car or hurtle down the road, we know that we're taking a risk. Every time you smoke a cigarette or eat fried food, you understand that you're risking your health just a little bit each time. And we can't blame God for our own choices. And yet that's exactly what this thinking allows us to do. This thinking is saying that everything happens for a reason, and God is that reason. Therefore, none of us are liable for anything. It's not the drunk driver's fault for getting behind the wheel. It's not the rapist's fault for the choice that he or she made. It's not the spouse's fault for cheating and now their marriage is in shambles. Hear me, church. God cannot be blamed for the brokenness of this world. If God is the author of death and all things evil, how can he be at the same time the author of life? Is he the God of the living or the God of the dead? You can't have it both ways. In the book of John, John writes, the thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy. My purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. Does this verse say all things are good? No. Does it say that God caused all things? No. It tells us that whatever happens, good or bad, God is working for the good of those who love him. Did God cause Moses to kill the Egyptian? No. Did he take what happened and bring good out of it? Yes. The result is the Israelites were delivered from slavery. Now, did God cause the Israelites to ignore his promise and not go into the promised land? No. Did he use the situation to raise up Joshua as our next leader? Yes. Did the result, the result is that Israel eventually took over the promised land. Did God cause David to lust after Bathsheba? Did he cause David to eventually kill her husband and to cover up his sin? No and no. Did he use the situation for good and break David's heart and bring him to repentance? Yes. The result is that Solomon, Bathsheba's son, became the wisest king and had the temple built for God. So again, I'll remind you that everything does happen for a reason, and sometimes that reason is we do stupid things. We make bad decisions, or people around us make bad decisions that affect us. Sometimes it's just because we live in a fallen world that we can't get away from the fact that the stupid things we do have natural consequences. But God, God can use even the worst situations and turn them towards his purposes. As Christians, sometimes we will suffer. We don't want, we don't and won't have all the answers as to why the suffering happens. But many times, it's just the result of living in a fallen world. Sometimes, I think God allows these things to happen to draw us closer to him. Maybe we've been off doing our own thing. Maybe we've forgotten to keep our focus on him. Now, again, I'm not saying God caused it. Maybe he allows it. He takes his protection from us in that moment, allows us. Maybe we don't get the prompting. We allow the devil to make the decision for us, and we make a bad choice. Before we close, I want to give you another thought. So we understand that God doesn't make everything happen. But I'm here to tell you that he can weave his purpose into everything that does happen. God doesn't cause innocent people to go to jail or the people we love to die of cancer. God doesn't cause senseless tragedies to occur, but when they do happen, he brings beauty from the ashes. 
He takes everything that happens and he works in it. He works through it to bring about his purpose. Maybe that purpose is to teach us something. Maybe there's something that we need to grow and to learn. Maybe God wants us to lean on him more. Maybe he wants us to learn that we can do all things leaning on his strength and not our own. This entire series, we've been unpacking these lies and focusing on things attributed to the Bible. But honestly, the Bible just doesn't say that. Now, perhaps you're new to Flint First or or fairly new and maybe even considering things of faith for the first time. We've been focusing a lot on what this series doesn't say and what the Bible doesn't say. But I want to share with you a couple things that the Bible does say. First, it tells us that everyone has sinned. In Romans, it says, For everyone has sinned, and we all fall short of God's glorious standard. We all sin. We've all made mistakes. We've all made stupid choices. Right? Second, there is a cost to our sin. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift, free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Third, Jesus died for our sins, but God showed his great love for us, sending his son to die for us while we were still sinners. Even while we're in the midst of sin, Christ died for us. And fourth, the choice is ours. If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God. And it is by openly declaring your faith that you are saved. Now maybe you're here today and you've never made that choice. Or maybe this is all new to you. Let me take you back to our original truth. In Romans 8, it says that we know God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. The key is those who love God. The truth is God loves you. As we just read in Romans, even while you were a sinner, even while you're in the midst of your sin, God still loves you. He sent his son to die for you, to redeem you. Again, he gives us the free will to choose. It's your choice to follow him, to accept him, to love him back. We would love for you to make that choice today if you have not made that choice before. I'd invite you to come to the altar during our closing song as we get ready to pray here. And if God has been speaking to your heart, if this is something that God is moving in you, then I would invite you to come and and either, again, sit at the altar or maybe kneel at the altar. This is your opportunity to make a choice, to love God, to live for him for all the days of your life. If God's leading you, come forward at this time while I pray. Almighty God, you hate sin, but you still love us. You still love us as sinners, even if and when we do. That doesn't mean you want us to stay there, Lord. That means that you want us to turn from our wicked ways, just as your scripture says. You want us to grow and to develop. Become more like you, Lord. That means, though, whatever we have done, whatever is in our past, does not change your love for us today. Lord, we understand that you did not cause all the bad things that have happened in our lives. You're not behind them, Lord, but we know that you did not leave us during those times. You were there. You were waiting for us to call on you. Lord, we seek your will in our lives. We seek your forgiveness for the sins of our past. We're sorry for living in a way that doesn't honor you and for doing things that are against your will. We do believe that you sent your son to die on the cross for our sins. 
We believe that when he rose again three days later that he claimed victory over sin. Thank you, Lord, for loving us even when we were unlovable. Thank you for thinking of us when you sent your son to the cross, for opening the door for us to accept and receive your grace and your mercy. We love you, Lord. Please send the Holy Spirit into our lives. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Stand with us as we sing the song. You call me out upon the waters, the great unknown, where he may fail. And there I find you in the mystery, in oceans deep, my faith will stay. you again that we're going to have pictures in here following the service. So if you're a small group leader or you're in the LBA or a trustee or in a different uh, department of our church as a volunteer, we'd invite you to stay so we can take pictures and celebrate our anniversary together next month. So church, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you today and always. You are dismissed.